This is an interview with Jane Jarko for the SEC Historical Society's Virtual Museum and Archive on the History of Financial Regulation. Today is January 6th, 2023, and I'm Kenneth Durr. Jane, good to talk to you today. Good to talk to you, Ken. Uh, you went to, let's start out at the beginning. Uh, I understand you went to, did your undergrad at Middlebury. I did, yes. I assume that was probably a liberal arts kind of a thing. It was definitely a liberal arts. Uh, when did you get interested in law? Uh, you know, I think it was always on my mind. Um, somebody who, you know, from a young age, I read the paper, paid attention to politics. Uh, I think I volunteered for my first political campaign when I was eight. Um, so uh, just interested in the world around me, world events, things like that. Okay. So then you went to Wisconsin, right? I went to law school in Wisconsin, yes. Uh, any any professors or programs that were influential? No, I think I pretty much took a general, uh, you know, I'm not sure I knew exactly what I wanted to do with law. Um, I probably had as at least uh, ha had um, or didn't have a great idea of all the things you could do with law. Um, you know, I think when you're... Um, you know, 18, 20 years old, 22 years old, you don't realize sort of that there are so many different things that you can can do um, with any sort of degree, including law. Any uh, interest in securities law at that point? You know, it's definitely not partic not not any sort of specific <laughs> interest in that. I think, um, you know, like a lot of people, I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do. I I went on to uh, a law to two law firms and did um, general litigation. I mean, uh, more business type of litigation, um, and um, decided that I, you know, really was more interested in a in a um, practice that was in the um, public sector. And I talked to a number of people, and the two um, two places that came up were the Securities and Exchange Commission and the, um, and the Justice Department. And um, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, interested me more. Um, so I applied there. Now, was that to the Chicago office or did you apply to the home office? That was Chicago. I was living in Chicago and applied to Chicago. Okay. Tell me about the interview. How did that work out? Um, the interview was good. I liked... Um, really liked the people um, that I interviewed with. Um, the office, the so so I, I interviewed with, although Chicago had both an exam program and an enforcement program, I, um, I interviewed with the enforcement program. Um, I can honestly say I probably didn't know an exam program existed when I, when I, when I interviewed there. And I can say that without feeling too badly because I think that's true for most people, <laughs> at least most lawyers. Um, and um, I really like the leadership of the office. Uh, you know, I, I learned a, a little bit more about you know what they what they did, and um, and it was a good it was a good interview, and I and I was um, given an offer. Did you interview with Bill Goldsberry, the director of the Chicago? <laughs> sure if you really interviewed with Bill at that time. <laughs> I got to know Bill later. Um, uh, so probably not, um, if I'm, if, if my recollection is right. Um, I'm thinking, gosh, I'm thinking Anita Nagler was the head of that office at that time. If she wasn't, it was soon after, but I'm not even, I can't remember. Um, so I interviewed with her. I interviewed with Mary Keith, who would later on become head of the office. Uh, interviewed with a couple of other people. Um, I liked them. I liked sort of the way they described the office, the work that was being done. Okay. So I assume you came in as a staff attorney or something. I did. I came in as a staff attorney. Working in enforcement. Yes. Talk about some of your early work, some of the way the, the the personnel there brought you up and got you, you know, gave you more and more, um, yeah, more authority. 
So I had had a couple of years of um, litigation experience. And um, <laughs> I think one of the things that sort of sent me uh, sort of on a trajectory of, of you know, my 28 year career at the SEC was um, pretty early on, I got thrown in with some, on some litigation. Uh, and I uh, was asked to, to write, probably, I don't remember what type of motion, but it, it wouldn't have been sort of a major motion. It's something I had done in private practice. Um, and I sat down and I did it and I turned it around. And I think that, um, you know, I, I made a decent impression on sort of being able to just get the assignment and, and turn it around and do it. And so, um, you know, I was assigned more responsibilities in that area in some, doing some some litigation um, and and then added on to it, um, you know, the 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 uh, investigative work um, that that, you know, is done in, in enforcement. So I had sort of a, a balance of, of those. Um, and I, I do think that the probably the area I made my mark or impression was sort of walk, stepping into what was a pretty big litigation matter and at least being able as a ju relatively junior person to, you know, handle some of the work that was being was being done, which I think um, that particular litigation was looking for a junior person to step in and, and help out. Are you able to talk about that litigation a little bit? What kind of case it was? Um, yeah, it was at the, let's see. Um, it was a market manipulation case uh, with somebody who had a pretty bad history. Uh, and as is true with, you know, some litigation, I mean, uh, particularly at the SEC, I think in litigation, you'd see litigation in which there were very aggressive um, attorneys on the other side who, you know, sort of knew how to really litigate and knew how to, <laughs> I, I hate to say, but, you know, some of litigation is, 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 is just sort of throwing, you know, mud at the, at the chain so that they don't work <laughs> too well or efficiently, right? And so, um, you know, having that versus sort of sometimes having people who don't have the resources or the knowledge, right, to, to, to go that path. Um, and this, you know, we had um, we had serious attorneys on the other side who were throwing a lot up a lot of obstacles. Um, so, uh, you know, it was it was time consuming in that sense um, to uh, to have to always be responding to to motions and and. Um, filing motions, you know, the litigation practice that is filing motions to compel to get answers to discovery and lots of steps that to, you know, do the basic things that you need to move litigation ahead, um, which is all, unfortunately, at least in my opinion, part of the game. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think that that was in, in some ways the, the the topic or the 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 area or the facts were in some ways less important than sort of that process stuff that was very time consuming. Interesting. Um, so at at some point you must have gotten the lay of the land and figured out how the Chicago office worked. Um, my understanding is that all the regions kind of had their own character. Um, if you had to characterize the Chicago office, um, how would you do it? I think Chicago was, um, a, you know, a pretty aggressive office. Uh, and again, I, at least for, for this part of my early career, I talk about enforcement. Um, and it was, was, and I think, I have no reason to believe it still isn't, the second largest regional office. Um, so uh, definitely had the experience and resources to uh, handle um, complex cases, novel cases, uh, which isn't to imply that other offices didn't, but being a little bit larger and, and having a, more resources makes that 
a little bit easier, I think, sometimes. Um, so I would say, you know, it was a, an office that was very much interested in, in making it, it, its mark and looking for uh, for uh, impactful cases to, to recommend to the commission and, and, and bring. Okay. Um, you moved from enforcement into the trial unit, or I guess the trial unit's part of enforcement. Is, is, is that right? That's right. Talk about the, the work there, um, how your career took that path and, and what kind of work you did in the trial unit. Okay. Uh, so again, I don't, I can't speak for offices other than Chicago, because I think it does, or at least back then did differ slightly. Uh, I think the the biggest difference that at least I, I, I perceived, and then I'm not going to claim to describe the home office, the Washington DC trial unit office 100% correctly because I wasn't part of it, but it, at, at least um, the, the Washington DC office, which is referred to as the home office, um, was quite a bit bigger than uh, in the enforcement division than, than you know any of the regional offices uh, and had a trial council um, unit that was quite a bit bigger as well. And my, my sense was that the trial counsel unit in the home office was more a separate unit than, um, than the investigative unit of, of enforcement. Uh, not to say they didn't work together, but they, you know, they operated with separate management, uh, separate review, things like that. In, in the regional offices, including Chicago, the, anybody in a trial position, and there usually weren't that many of us, uh, we're just part of the Chicago enforcement team. Uh, it just really had to do with the, uh, the, the work that you were assigned, uh, which was always going to be litigation as opposed to investigation. Okay. Um, so the other big difference, at least of what I, what, what I heard from speaking to people around the country was some offices, uh, had less of the investigative or fewer of the investigative team members um, on litigation that they, if, if a matter they investigated went to litigation. In some offices, it was really handed over primarily to the trial unit. In Chicago, that was not true. Um, really what changed more was the trial unit person became sort of the man, the, the manager of it and worked with uh, the the investigative team. Not to say that everyone on the investigative team always stayed on, but it was more common that there would be members of the investigative team uh, and the working with a trial unit member. Okay. Any notable cases that you you handled from that position? Uh, you know, I did a lot of um, of temporary restraining orders, so emergency actions during that time. Um, and those tended to be um, offering frauds, uh, Ponzi schemes, maybe some market manipulations. Um, so they have a very different feel and, and pace to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, if I'm thinking about the most memorable, um, I did an oil and gas Ponzi scheme that was out of the uh, out of Detroit, and um, it was memorable for a couple of reasons. One, um, I didn't know much. Well, much might be even saying too much. I didn't know anything really about the oil and gas industry. Uh, and I think one thing that I always loved about working at the SEC, whether it was in the trial unit or, or, or where, wherever, was um, although the law was, you know, the same, if you were looking into some sort of um, fraud, you, you, you had to understand the underlying business, right? So it, it, you couldn't describe what was wrong unless you understood, right, kind of how it was supposed to operate. So in order to be able to go in and talk about um, why the um, projections and, and, and reserve estimates and what those what that meant and why they were being misrepresented, yeah, I had to get my head around those things. Um, and so uh, although we were able to get the TRO pretty quickly based solely on the movement of, of money and sort of showing that they're, you know, in a Ponzi scheme, you can really follow the, the money flow. Um, 
we had to hire an expert witness who knew that area. And as part of being able to um, put an expert witness on the stand to testify, again, you have to understand what you're going to ask them. So it's really an interesting lesson in in that. And, um, and you know, it was an experience I had sort of that was similar to other things I did while I was at the SEC. But I do remember at the, I, don't, I think we got not at the TRO, but maybe at the preliminary injunction, the, the, the people running the Ponzi scheme had, which was, was very common and probably still remains common, had told all of the investors that they had all the money and it was the SEC's fault and they'd get the money back if only the SEC would stop. And I went into court and literally was, you know, sort of booed by a pretty uh, mean crowd. Um, <laughs> so that that was a sort of interesting experience. <laughs> I, I've heard of cases like that. Yeah. Um, speaking of, you're talking about learning curves. Um, this is a period when internet based scams are, are taking off and you started an internet focused in, enforcement effort there. Tell me a little bit about that and, and the cases that you were working on. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we found ourselves like, like everybody in this new world that very few people really had any understanding of, of um, how the internet could be manipulated to commit um, to commit fraud and the investigative techniques we had were not um, complete, were not were not sufficient. So the ability to track, for instance, um, you know where where uh, emails or where any of the any of the, uh, the the postings that were done on online were coming from and track them back, you know, to um, a particular computer or a particular place. You know, I think if I'm remembering correctly, that's called the IP address. Um, you know, that didn't mean anything to, to, to the vast majority of us, right? So we had a new investigative technique we had to, had to learn to, to under, understand, which was key to sort of proving um, the, the test. And of course, the... Um, the, the wider reach that the internet had, um, the ability to put things behind um, walls that, you know, you had to identify who you were to get behind. And the rules, the current rules at that time of the, at the SEC of, of requiring you to actually truthfully identify yourself, which, um, would again be an obvious stumbling block. And so internally, I think the SEC had to think a lot about, you know, what all that meant and, and was it proper for, uh, I mean, and, and, and if we could start to understand how um, to follow an IP address and to detect who that was coming from, that maybe the people on the other side could do the same, right? Mm -hmm. So there were interesting things going on. Like, you know, I think we had a standalone um, uh, computer somewhere uh, that that you could make requests to that were wouldn't like maybe link it to to the SEC and there was a process obviously that you know you couldn't anybody couldn't just sit down but you had to have that approved and give a reason why you didn't want to be traced um, and and so um, it was a, it was an interesting time to to sort of learn about something that was changing all of our lives dramatically. Um, no, I did some some uh, insider trading cases, but mostly, I think mostly, you know, uh, again, sort of your more basic frauds, mm -hmm. uh, offering frauds, Ponzi schemes, things like that. So during this this time, you're kind of moving up uh, in, in enforcement in the Chicago office, and and uh, you started to come into the newspaper headlines uh, a little bit. Um, I noticed that you were involved in a, a case in joining the Midwest Stock Exchange which sounds like it would have been pretty important. Yeah, it was um, definitely sort of a, a unique uh, case and um, one that could have significant um, importance for, you know, a, a, for a, although albeit a smaller stock exchange, but a, a stock exchange. Um, and really, uh, you know, we investigated the case, and it um, what it showed 
was that the stock exchange, which needless to say, had, you know, funds coming in, waiting for clearing and that sort of stuff, um, created sort of tried, created a, a sizable income off of sort of the float, right, of, of when they receive and when they pay out. Um, and an income that was um, pretty much uh, necessary for their existence. And so, uh, in which, needless to say, they hadn't sort of disclosed that they were whole, that they were generating money um, dur during those, and, you know, admittedly a couple of days, um, but, it, but uh, uh, you know, was that money rightfully theirs and and was that um at, and and at, per the securities laws was you know that disclosed so um so it was determined that you know they hadn't done the right sort of disclosure around that issue um and um and 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 we sued them um which you know was unusual uh at the time and you know i i'm almost sure they they closed down eventually and that was probably the beginning of the end mm. a, a bigger corporate case uh far more tell me about that one yeah that was a um sort of a a a, a big box uh retail store across at least the midwest if maybe other parts of the of the country um and that was a um, financial statement fraud case. Uh, and it really um, focused on a inventory manipulation scheme uh, that, you know, again, sort of overstated assets um, that was hiding, you know, uh, a significant um, uh, shortfall and Possibly, I don't remember a hundred percent, but there was um, also possibly the the improper payments of of expenses, you know, to to senior people and things like that. Um, and at that time, I know it probably feels hard to believe here as we sit in twenty twenty three, but at that time, sort of million dollar financial fraud cases were not as common as they are or multi-million dollar um so it was um it was uh, at, at its time you know the largest financial fraud case the sec uh, had brought um to unfortunately be eclipsed um you know hundreds of times <laughs> since in in uh, numbers way bigger than far more was at the time okay um, probably the biggest systemic one was late trading and market timing, which you were heavily involved with. Yes. Take um, me to that one. You were still in enforcement at that point, is that right? I was. I was okay. still in enforcement. Um, and, um, you know, that, that broke and um, teams were put in place across the country uh to look into that um and sort of, such a, sort of, it, was, it was very wide widespread and each each sort of investigation had its own perhaps little different um quirks um but i was involved with one um a call with the company called strong investment um which was a large Midwest uh, advisor and had a mutual funds um, out of the Milwaukee area. And um, um, it, its principal, it was Richard Strong, I think his first name was Richard, um, was um, the person involved in the potential um, market timing, late trading, which which made it different than some of the other cases in which there were more like customers doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, perhaps because of that fact, it um, got the attention of the New York Attorney General's office, which also was very interested in that case. So 
I spent and worked a lot with that office in um, pursuing the that, that the case against the individual uh, as well as as the entity and and a couple of other um, other individuals who held uh, senior positions, although not as as strong as the um, as the head Richard Strong himself. Um, so I spent a lot of time and energy. I, I uh, unfortunately at the time it was right after 9-11 and um, the New York AG's office was right around the um, World Trade Center, which I spent a lot of time in a hotel that looked into the um, the hole that was being dug and, and then re rebuilt. Um, so I have a very vivid memory of, of that of that time because of all the time I spent um, down in that area. Uh, so that was that was the probably the case I put the, my most amount of of uh, Re effort and resources into, um, you know, we, it, it did end up in in the in the shuttering of of, of Strong's um, capital management. I think it was called Strong Capital Management, um, as as uh, Richard Strong was given a, 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 a I don't know if it was a permanent bar, a time bar, but a bar. So it was. So I kind of it caused the the end of of, of that um, firm. So the, the late trading and market timing uh, investigations must have given you some some new experience in the whole in investment management uh, area. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to remember my timing exactly. Um, I had already had some experience with a, an action um, called Mineta Financial. Um, and, and so um, the Chicago office had a, um, a very aggressive um, investment advisor examination program. So we had in enforcement in the Chicago office I believe I had heard at the time that Chicago did sort of more investment advisor um, enforcement cases than than either all the regions or at least proportionately to our size. I don't remember which it was. Um, so I would have had some some work already in in the area, um, and and as a result, also worked with. Um, people who were on the uh, in the examination program, um, and so uh, it, I don't believe that was by any means my my first. Um, we did as a result of that strong case, which I was describing. There was also a second strong case, so you know it it it, it definitely brought um, you know some other other matters in in that area that that I was involved in. Why the the switch to to the exam side? Um, you you were building up a pretty strong record in enforcement. What what took you over to the other side? Um, I had enjoyed the um, the investment advisor uh, work that I had done, and um, and I had had uh, I had had. Um, contact with and was learning about, you know, the examination program as opposed to the enforcement program, which, which again, I think, you know, not merely just people who don't, didn't work at the SEC, but even plenty of people in the SEC probably didn't know exactly what the exam program did. Um, and I, you know, I think I, earlier I've expressed some of the um, frustration that is involved in Litigating and um, the same frustrations that that even um, touch on in enforcement investigations, and it you know it felt to me like there was perhaps a lot of good work that could be done in protecting um, investors uh, and sort of working to improve compliance in um, in industry participants uh, before maybe some problems happened um, mm -hmm. that that just felt like 
like it would might be more more satisfying to do that work without the hassle of or 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 the regular hassle of um that comes with doing litigation and enforcement work okay so so how did that work did did a job a position become open and you just decided to go for it yeah pretty much um chicago uh unlike most of the regions with the exception of of new york which is the the largest um, regional office uh, he has, has an exam program um, divided into two parts with two different senior um, managers. Uh, and so one was in the broker dealer area and one was in the investment advisor, investment company area. And the investment advisor, investment company area um, opened up. And, um, you know, another part of the investment advisor of that area that was of particular interest was the industry was really moving, shifting from sort of the broker dealer model to the investment advisor model. Um, so it had a path of, you know, sort of of growth with a changing industry just to really see how these changes um, were playing out and um, was an area that frankly could only grow um, just because of the sheer numbers of of uh, registered investment advisors and the growth year to year in that area. Why was that? What was your sense of, of what was what was taking place in the, the larger you know, business world to make that happen? Well, I, I think that depends on who, who, who you ask, because I think there are two answers, both of which probably have um, uh, uh, grains of salt, uh, of truth, truth in them. Um, and um, one would be that the, Compensation model is different from the broker dealer to the investment advisor. Uh, the an investment advisor is is, is um, compensated um, on assets under management, so it um, produces a, a sort of a steady stream of income. Uh, whereas the broker dealer is based on commissions. So somebody who you know a, a client that um, buys and holds and rarely trades doesn't generate as much income. Mm -hmm. so that's sort of one view. <laughs> the other view is that the the standard of conduct is different between the two, right? So um, a broker deal, uh, uh, an investment advisor is held to a fiduciary standard. Um, so, uh, you know, has to disclose, has to always put uh, its interest uh, behind that of its client. And, um, and uh, whereas... Uh, the broker dealer is is um, is held to a um, non fiduciary standard, um, has to act in the best interest of its client, but that you know under the law that doesn't always require that they put their interest second to the client. So um, you know, and that that's that's over the years, and particularly. I think the year is 2019, um, has gotten closer. <laughs> the, the standards have gotten closer, but it has affirmatively not been um, adopted that that, the, that they be the same standard. And, you know, that's a fight that's both political and in, and in the industry and, and uh, investor advocates that's been ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. Yeah. Tell me about the the way exams were done when you came in. Um, there must have been a sort of a, a, a standard procedure. Um, was there a you know? Yeah, I think the two. Total? I think the two key pieces, at least uh, I, on on quick thought, um, had to do with how exams were chosen and how exams were conducted. So. Um, there was a risk rating of each firm that was based on its form ADB. And the form um, had, has, you know, multiple questions and questions were, um, and answers to questions were assigned, you know, different risk points and, and ultimately you had a risk score. Um, and, like every government agency everywhere, the SEC, you know, doesn't have sufficient staff to uh, examine every 
investment advisor every year, let alone, frankly, at like every five years. Um, so, you know, you had to make a decision on how and where you were going to do um, your your exams. And, you know, a certain amount of your uh, resources were obviously set aside for sort of emergency uh, types of things. But in planning, you know, that risk score was um, was very key. And as a result, that risk score meant that there was a large number, not and an a not insignificant number of investment advisors that had never before been examined, never been examined by the SEC, because just didn't have the resources to get to the score point that they were at. So that was um, so the one thing that was happening was. Um, and, and some offices were trying to come up with creative ways to 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 de to deal with that, um, but it was just a, a fact and a and a, as a result of of, of resources. Um, so so there was a clearly a risk component to um, making the decision, but one that was leaving you know a gap that frankly the SEC was being criticized for by um, Congress among among others. Um, and then the, the second was sort of the process of conducting the exam. There was a, um, a, temp, a template-like um, area that listed, for exams, that, that listed, I don't remember, eight, ten areas to review when you went in to do the exam. And although, I, although you know, I think people would tell you that it wasn't required that all areas on every exam be reviewed. The, in practice, that was happening. So, um, so that meant that you know you had to commit the resources on every exam to look at all of the eight or 10, 10 areas. Um, so that was sort of the the process. And my, um, you know, my time. In um, in exam was um, greatly impacted by the Madoff scandal, where mm -hmm. you know a a, a, a um, real necessity to exam to, to examine and look at how we were uh, conducting exams and if we were using our resources correctly and um, what we needed to to change to um, sort of rethink that. The two things I just described: how you know, how do you determine risk, and 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 what do you do with that with that pool of of um, of never examined registrants, and then um, how do you decide what areas to examine at a at a registrant when you go in due to okay. resources? So, right? so we're talking about moving into the late two thousands here, um, two thousand seven eight, going into Madoff. Um, was Chicago basically doing, you know, doing exams the way uh, the Home Office OC uh, was 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 requiring? Was was that the way it worked, or did you have leverage as to how you you did things? Well, you know, I I think different people would have different views of the answer to that, right? So I think the the Home Office would would say that um, that like I described, that maybe you didn't have to do all of the sections, but in practice, that was what was being done. And certainly, I think that was how the regions felt that they were supposed to do. Um, so whether that was a miscommunication or not, I can't tell you, but um, but it was, um, the Home Office was very involved in um, confirming what, what um, what registrants would be um, examined, and um, and it and I mean, my sense was that it was um, that the that the home office had, had that there was less there was less autonomy. Not to say that there was none, but that there was less autonomy in in the regions. Um, okay. For example, Dean Gelke was was running IAIC. Uh, in the home office, did you speak to him a, a good bit? Did he sort of touch base on a regular basis? Uh, my contact was more with the the people who um, reported directly to to Gene. Okay. So they had a had a sys had, there there existed 
um, regional um, liaison type of people. And so they were really the um, people that at least my experience was as, as when I started to head the, the Chicago office, more of my contact was with was the, the liaisons. Okay. Um, anything else we should talk about having to do with your time in the Chicago office before we start to move to, to OC in the home office? Yeah, I mean, I think there were two things that went on in the Chicago office. Um, and again, this is, is, is we, we did, and this is, you know, maybe in the pretty close to when I um, went right before, you know, my last, my last maybe year or so in the Chicago office before I moved to the national um, part of OC. And I, I'd have to look back um, at, at the timing of when Lori just left and um, and uh, Carlos Florio came in, but I, um, but I believe with that change, um, as 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 always with upheaval, um, sort of comes the opportunity to do different things and and try new things. And so, the Chicago Regional Office he had um, had. Uh, started an attempt that we called the never before exam and um, registrants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to look for a way to get our hands around that part of our population and get that number down. And, and so, um, and, and I don't mean to say that other offices weren't doing the same thing, but, you know, maybe it was, I was willing to talk about it a lot. I don't know. But, um, yeah. And so, we were really trying to develop and, and, and you know, when you're in that, that world of very limited resources, I, I think almost like my guiding principle when I talk to people in OC, whether they were in DC or Chicago or another regional office was that, um, you know, you made a choice every time you used a resource to do one thing, it meant that a resource wasn't available to do something else, right? So you you know you really had to think about how you allocated those resources, and there was always going to be some risk involved in the allocation of resources. Um, so in deciding to tackle sort of the never before examined, we really wanted to think about how to get sort of some with limited resources to get at least some touch that would be, uh, give us some meaningful insight into the firm, uh, but not have to devote, you know, a large number of hours because we didn't have a large number of hours, right? So um, so we developed a, a, a process which over time, both while I was at Chicago and then when I became uh, head of the IA program nationally got refined as we as we did it to sort of have a better approach um, to look at that population. Uh, the the other thing, again, from a timing point of view, I think we started in Chicago, but then my my last months or year in Chicago was we started working on um, sort of an, an electronic uh, workbook to to do many phases, to document many phases of the exam process. It had been a paper process, right? And so we're now talking, you know, 2000 and I don't know, 2012, say, give or take a year. And, um, and you know, really needed to change to, to get out of paper, paperwork papers. It just didn't make any, any sense. The world, you know, it's, a, it's an enormous change, but it, it needed to be done. And so in Chicago, we developed a, what we call sort of a workbook. Um, and uh, that over the years developed into more, but you know, at a minimum, it was an attempt to capture um, sort of major exam decisions like scoping decisions, um, findings, uh, the, the basic, the most important things you would, uh, basic things you'd want uh, to be at your fingertips about an exam. Um, and, and that was really important um, because obviously most of the times you can't lose electronic information. Um, 
And it also meant that things weren't available to many more people, right? So um, if you had a question, so, so it wouldn't be unusual for somebody like in the position I was in, in Chicago, and frankly, when I when I went into the national, that you could get you could get a call from anywhere in the SEC asking you specifically about something that did or didn't happen on an exam. And it meant you could just, you know, fire up your computer and, and find that workbook and read it through and maybe get your answer. But if you didn't get your answer, it meant that you could, you know, exactly where to go, right? Um, it also served to document in a way that was consistent um, the things we did, which was important, particularly after, after Madoff. Um, and particularly after Madoff, the um, sort of supervisory um, sign-offs of all of the decisions, you know, I mean, as I, as I said before, and I, 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 I'm not, I can't really sort of minimize this, every decision that was made meant that something somewhere else wasn't going to get done. <laughs> and, you know, you, you know, fairly that, that sh decision, you know, should rest with a supervisor. Um, and so we wanted to document document that as well. Okay. Did Drew Bowden uh, call you up and ask you to come to the home office? Is that how it worked? I don't. I don't know if that's true. I, I had discussions with Drew. Um, so it's just again, I'm, I'm not going to remember my timeline exactly, um, but it would have been at the beginning of Carlin's. Um, time in, in, in OC, he brought all of the senior um, officers uh, to DC for discussion about um, OC and the direction and things to change. And really it was a, you know, strip everything off and let's re rebuild. Um, and so um, sort of my personality to not necessarily sit back and be quiet in those those meetings. Um, so, you know, I think I spoke a lot and and I didn't really know Drew or 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 um Carlo before then. Um but you know uh I, I met them sort of through my things that I expressed, some of which they agreed with and others which they didn't agree with, which was was fine. But you know the fact that we were just having that discussion. So I think what happened was um was with you know Drew's promotion, um, the position opened, and he and I had conversations about me taking that job. All right. So how how did things change? Um, um, how did you 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 start to implement this national program? So there were a couple of of things that you know I think having a regional perspective, where most of the work was. Done. I mean, the 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 work had been the, the way OC was set up, which was a little different than enforcement, because I, I think the well, I know the major the largest number of staff members in enforcement are in the home office. That was not true for OC. The the, the work was was primarily of exams was primarily done in in the regions. Um. So having that regional experience and and DC. Um, you know, was uh, helpful in coordinating all the things that happen internally in the home office um, and working with the regions, but, you know, sort of having the practical experience of conducting the uh, exams, I think, you know, at least we thought out in the regions that we had ideas that could improve the program. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, there was a combination of ideas that we thought could improve the program and and the fact that the program um, was under pressure to change to still exist. I mean, you know, it, it was certainly, um, you know, at that time, there was a genuine concern at post Madoff that the SEC might not survive. Mm. That um, And so everything and anything was on the table um, to change. And... Um, and so, you know, change was going to occur um, because of that pressure, I think. Um, so uh, there were a handful of things that really, um, you know, and I'll probably miss several of them. Um, but uh, I mean, one thing is we, we, we tried to take on tackling that never before examined population nationally. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we had started that process in, in, in in Chicago, not again, not to say other offices weren't doing something, but I was familiar with the way Chicago was had had started it. And um, Drew had um, started a what he called the presence exams for for private funds, and we sort of married the two together to come up with an approach, a national approach to um, to the never before examined population. And again, that was all about sort of making decisions about resource and risk. And the decision was made that the never before examined uh, registrant, we would pick one or two or maybe on occasion three areas to go in and do sort of a deeper dive into those areas and ignore maybe other areas. The view being that if we, if we could sort of try to determine what the riskiest areas might be for that particular registrant based on the registrant's ADB and some preliminary interviews and discussions, we would, by looking at the areas, um, the risk, the highest risk areas, get a sense of the, of the firm, right? Get a sense, if, if they were handling those areas well, they were probably handling other things well. Wow. Um, so, so, you know, it was try to, trying to do a limited, um, limited, <laughs> Uh, exam to get a feel for the registrant um, without committing huge resources to them. So that was one thing we took on nationally. And we were, you know, pretty successful nationally. And, and we rolled it out nationally. And that, again, I think would be a second part that I would, would highlight is we started to roll out national types of, of uh, exam programs, exam focuses. And I think the significance of that, again, I, I think that, you know, people who were in the home office prior to me getting there would tell you we already did those sort of things, but um, I think we probably did it a little differently. Um, the significance of that was uh, we really thought about it in a way of trying to get consistency, whatever the topic was, trying to get a consistent approach across the country to to how we were going to um, how we were going to approach the area of, of the, the focus area of those national exams. So, an, uh, as well as being able to um, to get the findings of those exams and and pull them all together to get sort of a national you know look at those issues. So um, the never before examined you know, was a more simple way of, of, of a, a more simple focus than some of the other national exams we did. Um, but um, again, it, it had a lot of value to kind of go through the never before exam and, and, and see which of the registrants, perhaps when we did this nationally, was there a, a type of registrant we were risk rating improperly, maybe from our old risk process, right? I mean, a lot of thought into that. And somewhere during that time, I know the risk rating based on the ADV was was tweaked, you no know, to to and, and and improved, and so that information could flow to kind of help all of all of that, um, as well as give us other information that was was valuable. Um, and there was a, a view, and I I I with my view uh, among others, uh, some might disagree, but um, that. You know, just even interacting with a registrant was super valuable. Um, and it was funny because one thing we learned from some of the registrants was, uh, it, which which I think is a really different part of the exam program and, and fundamentally different from the exam program than enforcement, um, is that um, we were not the opponent. You know, um, we were not the other side, although I know that they felt that way a lot. But um you know, there were things that uh, we did seminars across the country for new registrants and, and registrants that had never interacted with the SEC and tried to provide them information and in, in about our exam process, about, you know, the biggest risk areas where they might want to consider the sort of resources they might consider putting in those risk areas. And the feedback was generally, we, was generally from the registrants that was really helpful. Like, you know, nobody wants the SEC at their door, but this was a great way to get information. So I think there was more of a give and take. You know, we were we we were also trying to um, help them build stronger 
um, compliance programs. And, um, and, and I think a number of registrants saw, saw that at least as one thing we were doing um, and, 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 a, and a brought value to them. So, so that, you know, so that, so we had began these national um, programs, national uh, focus areas for exams. Um, another, in line with what I just said, another thing that came out of those national consistent exams was as we, as we examined the information we, um, we gathered, we started to put out um, risk alerts. So this was, you know, to, to assist the industry in saying, we've looked at the industry, here's some weak points we saw across the, across the industry when we looked at this area. Any individual advisor might not have had that weak point, but others might, and they knew they should improve it. Hmm. Um, so that was a, you know, not to say risk alerts hadn't been done before, but we started putting them out more consistently, I believe. Okay. Let's talk about some of the externals that came at, at you. Uh, it was a lot to kind of rebuild things. Um, cyber, uh, cyber fraud, uh, cyber security, um, that, that became an issue around 2013 with, with Target. Um, and you started to take some action there. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a little like the internet. Um, cyber kind of was all around us. And um, and uh, we didn't necessarily have a huge number of people who really uh, understood cybersecurity at the commission. And frankly, from Target and I forget which, how many financial institutions and, you know, every government agencies that were getting hacked into, you know, that it was a, a cross- the country and across industries didn't, wasn't, you know, the, the hackers knew more than the people, than, than the people who were, you know, running the, the show at these places. Um, so um, we took on, and, and it, it had, a, it really had two purposes. We took on an, a national cybersecurity exam program um, and ex examinations. Um, and the two um, purposes were for us to learn what the state of cybersecurity was in the industry and for us to offer, based on what we were focusing on, some assistance as to what the uh, top priorities might be in a registrant thinking about a cyber program. You know, and in and in the industry, and, and in this case, it went beyond the investment advisors, the broker dealers were involved also. So and, and in the industry, you know, you had you had industry participants who were um pretty savvy in cybersecurity. They had experts, and you had some that had no idea at all. Just, you know, I mean, from the most simple thing of um if you don't <laughs> if if you if you don't um sort of, you know, upgrade and put in every time you're notified that there's a, you know, <laughs> there's new things to, 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 to your program, that you might, at some point, that's going to lead to vulnerabilities, right? That, that are, there are no more patches going in, there are no more security going in. I mean, things that, you know, I mean, to be honest, I hadn't thought about, like, I, that wasn't my area of expertise. I was as ignorant as, as anybody. Um, so what we did is, you know, we had to go out and find some expertise, um, whether it was, um, and we, we looked at um, not just internally, but we worked with some other government agencies um, to, you know, really talk to people about what should we, what should be our focus? And, um, and, uh, and, and industry groups, some industry groups who had spent some resources and time and had people who were valuable in this area, so did a lot of work in trying to really think about what we, what where we were going to look, what we when we went in to do these exams, and we made the decision that we were going to publish our document request before um, or at the time that we started, and that decision was made um, based on uh, for, for for the you know primarily because as I mentioned, this had a purpose of helping the industry think about. Um, cybersecurity, and particularly those who were um, didn't have a lot of resources yet spent there, 
And so, you know, if they weren't examined, they could still pull up our document request and go, wow, these are the areas that, you know, we need to focus on. It was very, very well received. The industry was really, really happy about that and <laughs> created down the road. It created a lot of, how come you're not doing that with everything? <laughs> no. um, and there was some internal view that, you know, we shouldn't do that. We're going to tell everybody where we're going and, you know, they're going to change that. And, 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 and I sort of was like, great, you know, right? No, I mean, in some ways it was a nobody loses situation, right? Um, nobody wanted cybersecurity to, to, to be an, a vulnerability. Um, you know, you just had to pick up the paper and know that if it happened, it was a group, huge embarrassment. Nobody wanted it. It was an embarrassment. It caused, you know, it was costly. Uh, depending on where it, where it happened, there could be private privacy information that was in the wrong people's hands. I mean, everything about it was bad. So, um, so, you know, probably more so than anything else I, I did at the SEC, I viewed that as um, as really something that was done um, done in partnership with the industry to help help them in, to help improve the industry for everyone's benefit. Nobody was hurt besides the scammers <laughs> by us improving. This information that you developed, did this feed into the creation of Reg SCI? You know, I mean, it, it, I, I can't answer that. Um, and I don't, I don't know whether the, those, the people developing the Reg already had those resources to, to know that sort of information. So I, I, you know, I don't really know. Okay. So there wasn't a transmission from, from the exam program into the, the rulemaking. I mean, they would have had like anybody else, um, our you know our findings and all of those things. Um, so, and as with, I can't think specifically on this particular cyber, uh, and and there were multiple cyber reviews. Um, typically, before we undertook a national um, targeted exam we would have engaged with other divisions of the commission that um, would have had an interest or knowledge to help us um, think about the issue. Okay. So, you know, so it, it well could have, you know, there could have been back and forth there. Okay. Some other things that you looked at um, during your time, alternative mutual funds, for example. Yeah, I mean, you know, alternatives, um, there's always a hot product, right, in the market. Um, and alternatives became a hot product at one point. Um, so alternatives had, had existed sort of in the private fund area, and they started bleeding over into um, 40 Act registered, you know, mutual funds um, that were available to, 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 to anybody. And... Um, it posed, a, you know, sort of a, a unique situation in that the portfolio managers who had experience in the area were not experienced with the full 40 Act regulations, right? Like they, they hadn't had to operate on, under, under that. The mutual fund complexes that wanted to add that as a product to offer people um, weren't experienced with the, um, the risks involved in alternative product, all, all, the, 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 the assets underlying alternative funds. But there was, but they both desperately wanted to sort of jump in together because it was a big area uh, uh, in the market that was opening up. So everybody was very, you know, speedily he heading into it. And it, it kind of created the possibility for a the perfect storm for perhaps not the best um, set of compliance and understanding, right? Each, each of those two um, key components had a big um, knowledge gap. Mm -hmm. And and so um, so you know we felt it was really important because it was becoming a hot product for sort of you know that was being sold to the average investor to um, make sure that there weren't some significant gaps when they came together in their compliance programs. Um, 
hard products to understand, right? The underlying assets are, are confusing. The risks are, are much greater. Um, all needed to be disclosed. You know, you, you had to make sure, I mean, whenever you got a complex product, you had to make sure your compliance people could at least have enough understanding or put a person on that staff program who had that uh, compliance staff program understanding to understand if those risks were being dealt with, right? I mean, these are not the, so it, 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 it was a, a concern that there, that it could, it could implode because of the sort of, you know, holes in each of their knowledge base, each part of their knowledge base. Another initiative you, you, uh, took on was the share class initiative. Tell me about that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the fees associated with um, mutual funds and different share classes of mutual funds, um, you know, also became uh, a, a a significant disclosure issue, and there was always. Um, and conflict issue, conflict of interest issue. You know, there's always, there was this, this um, tension um, about, um, as we had multiple share classes, right? This tension with a, when you're a fiduciary, which share class do you put your um, investor, your client in and are, you know, is, is if they're in a share class that costs slightly, more costly, which in and of itself, the commission has said over and over and over again, you know, cost is not the only factor in everything. In, but, um, you know, were they getting something for paying a little bit more, right? And, you know, I think we got to this situation where there were certain share classes that cost more, where um, it appeared that in some of those situations, there really couldn't be anything that they were getting more of, except for paying more and more compensation was 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 going to industry participants, and there was no disclosure around that. Which you know that at heart the the um, the, SEC, the the securities regulations are about disclosure. Although you know when you get into your fiduciary duty, you know there's and you know you also have the requirement to put your your interest second to your client. So, um, and there was a lot of money, you know, involved with that, you know, sort of pot and, and, and <laughs> like a lot of things, um, pennies, maybe for some investors, a couple of dollars, maybe $20, whatever it was over the course of year of the year, um, maybe not long, a lot to any one individual, but huge sums of money <laughs> when added up, when added up, right? Um, and so, you know, there was a real focus on 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 that to um, to to um, make it, you know, more transparent and um, and uh, you know to 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 stop that practice when there was really no advantage. So, um, was this an exam initiative, or was it uh, like the risk alerts where you put out the word, "This is this is what we expect. This is what we want to see." So again, I'm going to go a little, I believe we, I believe that it was, um, we would have picked up over the years before that, we would have picked up on, on individual uncoordinated exams that were going on throughout the country, the issue. Um, it became coordinated as a national focus with a, um, interest by the by the in, in enforcement's focus on investment management okay. and so um you know I, I think that there would have been um sort of almost a they were probably investigating enforcement was investigating some matters in this issue we were at the same time um had seen it, had probably referred some of these cases to enforcement, and now we're rolling out a, a larger look at it, uh, you know, with their interest in what we what we found. Okay. 
we've we've talked about a, a lot of things that you were you were concerned with during your your time at OC um but we we haven't picked up again on really on the whole growth of the investment advisor investment company sector um talk about um the the options the SEC was was entertaining a lot of options at this period and, and talk about where you and and the, the OC directors were on things like third party auditors, um, new user fees, SROs, those kinds of things. Yeah, there were, I mean, I think that, that across the board, you know, nobody could deny sort of, I mean, you, you had the numbers, right? You, you could look year to year, the number of, of registered investment advisors and could see that that growth was, was, was significant year to year. Um, and um, you could see that, you know, one of the one of the primary uh, um, goals of the SEC across as the SEC, SEC as an agency is to protect investors, and um, you know, as is that became, if not the biggest, probably the biggest, but if not the biggest, one of the biggest um, uh, areas that was growing in this in in the securities industry you know how did you um how did you uh get your arms around it to um as a regulator right as, to, to 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 regulate it because you didn't get an automatic growth in internal sec resources with the growth in the industry right like that would be one way right but that wasn't what was happening um so and in fact you know, it, there was a, a period of time where there was uh, hiring freezes while this was growing and all those sort of things. So, I mean, you know, it, it all the things you mentioned, right? It's it, it, an, an, an IASRO, um, user fees where the money from the user fees would be used to, uh, for the SEC to hire, hire more, more resources. Um, third party, party audits, they all were given a lot of discussion in the SEC. I mean, there were just, there was high level discussion about the viability um, and the usefulness of, of, of all of them. But the outside pressures, you know, I think had um, brought in the realities that there were um, people on, on the pros and cons of each of them, right? Um, and, you know, that started with, you know, uh, not surprisingly, as we as we sit here today in relatively polarized political situation, um, the polar our polarized Republican and, and Democratic parties views on all of those, which no matter which issue you looked at, they felt on different, they fall on different sides. And of course, you know, the commissioners themselves, right, we had five commissioners that are by law, um, you know, Two are the chairman is appointed by the president, who gets two more appointees, and the the party not in power gets two appointees. So it, you know it, it's 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 got a political uh, tinge to the commission, no matter you know whatever the re that's the reality, and so it, it expressed those sort of um, polarizing opposite views on all of these in the commission itself. How about you know, the industry? Then, Where was the industry on this? So so then you have the industry, right? And so the industry, um, you know, I mean, I, the the industry probably the thing it wanted the least was an SRO, right? That that was, I mean, that, at least that was my impression. Uh, they may tell you differently, but that was my impression. The thing they wanted the least was an SRO. So in some ways, you know, where they would never want fees, they were perhaps more open to fees because at least that meant there wasn't an SRO. They were happily, at least my impression have had our budget increase. You know, they would be like, they said, you guys do a great job. Um, somewhat self-servingly on their part, you know, I don't think that was necessarily a, a truthful expression expression on their part, but you know, they they knew they knew us, right? They knew us. So um, you guys do a great job. Why don't you just get more examiners, right? Um, you know, the third party, you know, as we examined a third party auditor, there were so many complications with that, you know. Um, who would do it, right? Because they, because, because um, the big, big accounting firms, you know, that they, they, if they undertook that, they would then have independent 
uh, you know, problems in, within being independent. Um, you know, what liability and what powers would they would would you know? So that one seemed, at least in my opinion, as I sat in those discussions, in some ways the 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 hardest to 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 get done. Um, uh, so um, so you know, all of these things were considered and all of them had, um, you know, very strong opposing positions when you looked either from a political industry or frankly, investor group points of view. Um, and, you know, it, it's just, it was just the reality of, of being um, at the SEC uh, and I'm sure plenty of other agencies when um, there really wasn't a, con a consensus on sort of, you know, what the best approach to things is. Right. Was this in Mark Wyatt's tenure at, at the head of OC that these discussions were taking place? Oh, now you're testing me, testing my, a memory of mine, which uh, which involves placing things in, in a time frame, <laughs> which is really bad. Um, well, he I, made I, the decision. He made the decision to, you know, reorganize substantial yeah. yeah okay um and t t tell me about that impl implementing the decision and and as much as you remember about actually making that decision sure. which was a pretty big step yeah so so you know the one thing we and oc had power over was our own resources right so let's take a round number because at, at certain times this would have been accurate a thousand a thousand people who were made up oc um so um our numbers as as a broke down for um, broker dealer and investment advisor examiners, um, no longer reflected the change in the business model in the industry. Right, so it, it, we we hadn't changed those resources to change what we've discussed, um, and we had the reality that on top of that, right, of course there is an SRO in the broker dealer area, right. So I think Mark, you know, cor completely correctly <laughs> assessed, we can only do change the things we can change in OC, right? So um, maybe that's really at least the first thing we can do is try to take resources uh, primarily from the broker deal dealer area, but we also had, had, had some other small areas uh, of OC with, you know, smaller, fewer staff members and reallocate them to the investment advisor area. Um, and I, you know, in, in, in almost always that, that, that made, you know, just common sense, made, everything about it made sense. Of course, you know, you're talking about individuals at this point. So you have to deal with at least some individuals who may have spent um, a significant number of years, or in some cases, the majority of their career focused on something and then we're going to be asked to learn something else, right? So, um, and you're dealing with individuals. So some of the people are gonna be super excited and some people are gonna be not excited at all, right? To, to, to do this. Um, so, you know, in we sort of had a simple uh, solution, reallocate res resources, which all of a sudden, you know, had an enormous impact on, on, on individuals. So we had to figure out how we do that. And, um, you know, of course the SEC, staff has been unionized for a long time prior to this. And so any sort of major reorganization um, would require, you know, the consent and, and working hand in hand if you wanted it to go smoothly um, of the union and the union support. Um, and so, you know, Mark, uh, you know, from the beginning felt that we should um, reach out and work with the, with the union to see how we could imp uh, implement, you know, this this solution, and and that's what we did. And um, you know, I sort of headed that um, and worked with um, you know a member of the union, the two of us headed it, I should say more correctly, um, to to think about how to get people to volunteer and what they needed if they volunteered. You know, what, what were they worried about, right? A, a, a individually, a, sort of a lack of knowledge and how we were going to approach that, uh, that they might have. Um, just, you know, what it meant for them individually and, ha and how to make that transition worthwhile to, to them. And, you know, our goal was a all volunteer 
and not have to, um, you know, not have to require somebody who wasn't interested. Um, so, you know, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of work, a lot of, um, uh, you know, I mean, there's so many things that come in, in, into play, right? We, when you're doing that, they're going to be, you know, let's just say it was, it, since it was primarily from the broker dealer side, right? If you cut that staff in a third, uh, to a, thir a third of it off, like, were they going to lose management positions, right? I mean, these are the things that properly the union had to think about, right? How, who was going to get management positions in the IA program? I mean, there were those sort of things that are, that, you know, that was in the, that the union properly wanted addressed. Um, and so we had to work through just so many things to do it and get it done. The relationship was really great. I mean, you know, um, not to say that uh, we, I, that every, uh, that I agreed with every position they were taking or, or they agreed with every position I was taking on behalf of management. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, we, we recognized, and, you know, this is that the, the fact that you, we agreed to disagree on some things and figure out, you know, the best solution and what were things we really, really had to kind of go head to head with and what were things we could live with giving up. And, uh, and, you know, but it was a very um, positive relationship Um that I think, um, you know, and I, I appreciated the union recognizing um, that that the change had to be made. We, mm -hmm. we couldn't exist the way we did. It sounds um, like in some respects you were working on a case-by-case -case basis on this. Yeah, I mean, it did get down to, um, I mean, there were surveys of the, you know, we had to put out, you um, uh, you know, polls and surveys and ask people, you know, the first time, would you be interested? But whoever answered yes, you know, they weren't committed and all these, you know, first you get it, you get sort of an indication of interest, right? And do the numbers look like, how do those look? And it looks okay. But then after you get an indication of interest, which, you know, again, a survey, so everybody's, they're all case by case, case getting, getting input. Um, but, you know, each one of those people has different concerns, right? About what it means for them. Right. And, um, so you had all of those types of things It just, you know, took, and it took time, it took a lot of time to, to get it done. And, and it sounds like training is part of this whole process as well. Without a doubt, training, the concern of, um, I mean, if you had sort of had been in the broker deal program and you were a senior person with a lot of knowledge and you were at a certain government grade, right, that where, you know, you got to your position, uh, in the in the SEC, I think it was a grade 14. Um, you know, were you going to be judged when you came into the IA program as a grade 14 IA examiner? Because that was, as the union pointed out, kind of unfair, right? I mean, <laughs> you just asked me to change my job and I don't know anything about it, but you're going to judge me as if I had the same amount of experience. So, you know, the, the number of issues were in some ways, you know, almost endless. Um, and we had to address those and, and um, you know, the union did a great job of, um, of representing the interests of, of, of the staff to make sure all those things were addressed. Okay. Uh, we've covered a lot of great stuff here. Um, is there anything else that we should touch on? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Okay. Talk, talk about the decision to, to leave and go to promontory. Well, the, the two are unconnected. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't um, a decision to leave to go to promontory. Okay. Um, it was a, a decision to leave. Um, you know, I, I will say that in my brain, somewhere during my career, I picked a random number based on how old I would be, maybe of about 30 years at the SEC, right? Like, I, and I'll admit, sort of random. <laughs> um, I had a couple of things like all of us do in our lives that impacted that decision, you know, uh, family deaths, health scares, things like those sort of things that um, I got to a point um, just shy, a little bit shy of the, the, the that point. Um, the kids were almost out of college. <laughs> you know, all the things that go into making a decision. And I, I, I happen to be somebody who loves to travel. I'd like to take sort of adventure trips. I take, go backpacking in 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 Chile. I go 
biking. I do lots of things like that. And um, I got to the point where I sort of said, you know what, I'm not going to stick. I, I, there's no reason to stick here for another year and a half just because I had this random 30 years, right? Yeah. And really that's what happened. <laughs> um, I had a great career. I loved my time. I was super lucky for somebody who in some ways stumbled into the SEC. Um, super lucky to have, you know, multiple jobs. It was always interesting. And I just sort of, you know, felt like it was a, t a time now to do something different with my life. Um, I really retired without um, thinking about the next job. Um, you know, ultimately I, I felt like I didn't want to work full time. That was not sort of, so that, that took off a whole series of things. You know, you can tell from this interview how many times I've said how much I love litigation that that wasn't going to be what I was going to do. Um, so, you know, I had some conversations I had liked sort of um, looking at compliance programs and, and things like that. And one of the firms I had conversation with was um, Promontory. And, you know, I, I went in as a consultant there. I was not a, an employee. I did end that. Um, that did end this past December. So I was there for four years. Okay. In, in those four years, frankly, I, I, I got started to get calls to do expert witness work. And, and really that's sort of what I do now is, um, you know, I take on expert witness assignments. It is not full-time by any means. Um, and, uh, you know, it works well with sort of my um, varied experience at the SEC, right? I, I, I did, wasn't just in, in enforcement. I was also in, in, in the exam program. Right. Sounds like a great arrangement. I'm, I'm glad that we could arrange to have this interview. I really appreciate the talk. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for... Okay, yep. Well, good luck with your project.